Audiences loved her perky Midwestern innocence. She hated that word. She's perky. Perky Pam Dover. Perky Pam. The sparkle is something inherent in her. It's not something that she's putting on. And her down-to-earth charm caught the attention of the man who would become her soulmate. She's very grounded. I mean, really self-made in who she is and, and confident in herself. But as a young New York model, she sometimes got into situations over her head. I'm finding out that I'm in a potential orgy situation and trying to pretend that it's okay, I can cope. When tragedy struck her family, it became almost too much to bear. The family was decimated, and I suddenly started to understand the depths of despair that would drive somebody to jump out of a window. Years later, she was further tested by the loss of a friend to an unspeakable crime. It was someone that just did it because they had delusions about this little girl that nobody knew. But Pam Dauber has found the strength of spirit to overcome every crisis. And through it all, she's never been afraid to take a chance on life. It's like the train pulls up to your door, and either you get on it or you let it go by. And I just always got on the train. From Mindy to motherhood, it's been a journey filled with adventure. This is Lifetime's intimate portrait of Pam Dauber. Lifetime's Intimate Portrait, hosted by Meredith Vieira. I'll never forget the hilarious antics of Pam Dauber and Robin Williams on one of my favorite sitcoms, Mork and Mindy. They looked like they were having such a good time. Who knew that all the while, Pam was still living under a shadow of loss. To her credit, she turned that pain into determination to find her own happiness and have a better life. I'd say marrying one of People Magazine's sexiest men alive, Mark Harmon, was a pretty good start. And then having two great kids. But Pam Dauber's strength would be tested one more time. I'll let her tell you about it because this is her story, her words. You just better keep your distance or you're going to hear me scream like you've never heard anybody scream. I've never heard anyone scream. <laughs> in 1978, Pam Dauber was a total unknown in Hollywood, a successful New York model who was taking her very first steps as an actress. I am so green. I was completely intimidated, and I'm just there faking that I know what I'm doing. But literally overnight, she and another unknown, Robin Williams, were thrust into the Hollywood spotlight with the debut of their new TV series, a quirky comedy called Mork and Mindy. I remember the radio DJs talking about Mork and Mindy in the morning. It was something that rarely happens, where everybody is talking about something the next morning after it's been on. It is a weird kind of thing, zero to 100, you know, or actually zero to Mach 1. Things changed radically. It was wild. Pam was in shock. She was a huge success in a series she never even auditioned for. I never thought I would be an actress. It was like some magical thing that other people did, but never that me. But then nothing in Pam's life had ever gone quite the way she planned it. Pam Dauber was born on October 18, 1951, in Detroit, Michigan. She was the first child of Jean Dauber, a young commercial artist, and Thelma Dauber, a housewife. When Pam was two years old, the family moved to a middle-class suburb in nearby Livonia. It was a real Midwestern kind of upbringing in that, you know, you learned to ride your bike on the sidewalks and you walked to school. As a little girl, Pam was happy and fun-loving, but her boundless energy earned her a bad reputation with some of the parents in the neighborhood. I was the little girl that the other moms didn't want their little girls to hang with because they thought that I was the bad influence, when really it was their daughters, but I just went along with it. Pam's constant companion was her younger sister, Leslie, who was born in 1954 with a congenital heart defect. Leslie's particular heart problem was that the heart was malformed. She didn't get enough oxygen. So it, it you know, it, it, it made her tire easily. She was just someone who was a little softer in general. I was more of a rabble-rousing kid that climbed trees. Leslie was a very kind, sweet soul. And Pam was like a big sister. She teased her and tormented her. The Dauber girls may have had a typical Midwestern upbringing, but their father made sure it was never boring. My father 
has always been an incredibly happy-go-lucky character with a wonderful sense of humor. It was like being raised by a leprechaun. I think my father and his wonderful sense of humor um, has, has had a huge influence on me. She's got a bit of the devil in her. I think it comes from the father's sense of humor. She has a playful quality. Pam's dad also made sure his family experienced the world outside their sheltered suburb. I always joke with my mom that my father has dragged my mother kicking and screaming through every museum on the planet. My father's love for adventure and change, I think I got that. And whether that's DNA or just appreciation, I don't know. But Pam's parents gave her an even greater gift by taking her to the theater. For my 13th birthday, they took me to see Oliver. I sat in this theater seeing my very first musical comedy, knowing somehow I have to know more about this. Somehow, I, 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 it was the most magical thing I had ever seen. The Daubers went to every Broadway show that came to Detroit. And when they came home, Pam and Leslie would act out their favorite parts. I was loved to sing, just because I loved to sing, not because I thought I had a good voice. I'd put together the little show in the, in the living room, and she got the little parts, so I always got the leads. When she got to high school, Pam was a natural standout in both choir and art. But she had trouble focusing on her other classes. She would probably be the first to admit that she wasn't the best student. If you think of the, if you recall the Beach Boys song, uh, fun, 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 till her daddy took the t bird away, that pretty much summed up our existence. I think my main focus was having my friends. And honestly, I didn't know how to study. And so I slid through high school by the skin of my teeth. Pam was shocked in her senior year when her choir teacher warned her that her chattiness was earning her a D in her favorite class. I only got good grades in art and choir. <laughs> now I'm really shot. I'm going to be killed and grounded yet again. And uh, he said, but if you audition for a lead in the musical, I'll give you a C. And I thought, this guy must think I'm pretty good. So I auditioned for uh, the lead we were doing Kismet at the time. And I got a lead in the musical. Kismet lived up to its name for the 17-year-old. I had no idea that she was that talented because she, we were just always having fun. And it wasn't until I saw that I was in the audience and I saw the musical and I thought, oh my gosh. We got a standing ovation. I was like, ah, I like this. <laughs> But it didn't mean to me that I was going to now go out and have a musical comedy career. I didn't know what I wanted to be. And because I could draw, I assumed I would end up being a commercial artist of some sort. When she graduated from high school, Pam went to Oakland Community College, hoping to pull up her grades and transfer to a university. But her life changed direction when she stumbled onto a job as an auto show model. We were the models on the car that would open up the car door and tell you, look inside, we need to buy this car. You made a lot of money. You'd work five hours a day standing on your feet at the auto show. And I had my white and yellow little outfit and my white shiny go-go boots and my batwing eyelashes. I mean, I was pretty cool. And uh, life was looking pretty exciting. In addition to her work in the auto shows, Pam soon began doing fashion shoots for Detroit department stores. She decided to try modeling full time. I dropped right out of OCC and thought, well, I'll go back to college later. This is fun. I'll, I'll do this for a while. Pam continued modeling locally for the next three years until Kismet struck once again. A girl that I knew a model in Detroit said to me, I'm going to go to New York and see if I could become a New York model. Do you want to come with me? Pam went to New York on a lark, and the very first day she was there, the 21-year-old model was signed by the prestigious Wilhelmina Agency. It was the most, one of the most exciting days of my life because I really didn't know that this was the direction my life was going to take. So I went home, packed my little bag. Three weeks later, I moved myself to New York City and in with Toy Russell. We were straight off the boat from Michigan. We knew absolutely nothing about New York, and we just loved it. Within no time, Pam was one of the country's top catalog models. It was during a really all-American period in the modeling world, and she had this amazing personality. I think that it was just infectious. After taking a quick television acting course, Pam started landing commercials, and she soon found herself making $60,000 a year. Liquid Prell for natural beauty. It was like magic money. You do this job, and then checks would just come in. 
but the glamour of modeling paled in comparison to the lights of Broadway. Pam really wanted to be a musical comedy star. And when she would get paid from her modeling job, she would take her money and she would take singing lessons and acting lessons. While Pam was taking her very first steps toward a career on the stage, she was also struggling to stay pencil thin for her modeling jobs. She came dangerously close to developing an eating disorder. I discovered, you know what, if I eat this haagen I'll bet I could make myself throw it up. It never went into bulimia for me. Um, it wasn't an obsession. I just thought I was onto a pretty good idea. Bulimia was only one of the many pitfalls of the modeling business in 1970s New York. It was a very decadent city and it was a very decadent time. I think because of who she is and her wholesome world and her family, where she came from, and her personal values, she skirted through all of that really well. But I was, I was definitely got myself in situations over my head going out to some house in New Jersey and finding out that I'm in a potential orgy situation and trying to pretend that it's okay, I can cope. And really, it's like, going, oh, get me out of here! The young model often escaped to the safety of Michigan for family visits, but the home that had once been her source of stability now represented sadness and loss. We had a lot of family members die, six family members in a year and a half. My aunt, my uncle, my other uncle, my, I mean, just grandmas, I mean, it was, I mean, the family was sort of wiped out. 24-year-old Pam fell into a deep depression. I didn't know what anything meant. I was so lost. And I suddenly started to understand the depths of despair that would drive somebody to jump out of a window. Not that I, the thought that, the fact that I even could relate to that scared me to death. Next on Intimate Portrait, Pam soars to stardom opposite the world's greatest prankster. She's got this great laugh that that would be the reward, you know, that she... Oh! And later, she finds true love. Mark Harmon is the kind of guy you pray to God you'll meet. When Lifetime's intimate portrait of Pam Dauber continues. You're watching Lifetime's intimate portrait of Pam Dauber. By 1975, Pam Dauber, the small town girl from Michigan, had made the jump from the Detroit auto show circuit to the New York modeling business. She was now an aspiring actress with a busy career as a model, but behind the glamour and success, she was suffering from depression. I was traveling in Paris and traveling to Morocco and Switzerland, and but I was really lost inside. Realizing that she had a serious problem, Pam began to see a psychiatrist. When you don't have your family and friends as, you know, backups all the time, you know, that that is a way of working through some of these things, and it was very helpful to her. In therapy, Pam uncovered her deep-seated guilt about being healthy, while her sister Leslie still suffered from severe heart problems. There had to be something wrong with me, in my mind. It just wasn't fair that I was the okay one and she wasn't. Just a few months after the devastating loss of six family members, tragedy struck the Daubers again. Leslie's heart condition had gotten worse and she underwent surgery that went terribly wrong. She went into cardiac arrest as soon as they started making the incision and they didn't have anything ready. They went on and did the surgery, but she just didn't make it. Leslie died at the age of 22 in December of 1976. No one expected anything other than total recovery. And I, we were all just shocked and devastated. It was so bizarre. Uh, she was a bridesmaid on Saturday and dead on Tuesday. Pam returned to New York, but she had lost interest in everything, including her career. Thank God I was seeing Dr. Gordon during my sister's decline and then death, because I don't know what would have happened to me. And then out of the blue, I get this phone call to go and meet Warren Beatty. Actor director Warren Beatty was casting his new movie, Heaven Can Wait. When Pam was asked to audition for him, she decided to take a chance. Although she didn't get the part, Beatty gave her some much needed encouragement. And he said to me, well, all I can tell you, the type you are and the age you are, if you're not in, in acting class, you're crazy. His advice was a catalyst for Pam. She focused her energy on her acting career and landed her first professional stage role at Connecticut's Goodspeed Opera House. I got this little role, I wasn't the star but who cared? After Sweet Adeline, Pam was thrilled to begin work on her first feature film, Robert Altman's A Wedding. Suddenly, 
I'm doing a scene with Howard Duff or Victoria Gassman, Desi Arnaz Jr. Pam suddenly found herself in demand as a Hollywood actress. ABC Television jumped at the chance to sign her to an exclusive contract. The network cast her in a pilot for a sitcom called Sister Terry. I come out here to do Sister Terry, where I play a nun, a streetwise nun who talks like this. She had been a gang leader in New York, and she's wearing a habit. Pam Dog started the pilot by riding around on a bicycle, looking very cute in jeans, and suddenly it changed, and she went into this house, and she put on a nun outfit. That was the premise. She's Sister Terry. She's really a nun. And everybody said, what a not good premise, good night. Meanwhile, a new comic named Robin Williams had scored a hit in a guest appearance on Happy Days, playing a zany alien named Mork. Producer Gary Marshall's company was putting together a show called Mork and Mindy to spotlight Williams' unique talents, but they needed a Mindy. Pam's performance as Sister Terry was still fresh in their minds. We remembered that show, and I said, that girl I saw in the commissary, and she's good. To sell the show to the network, the producers put together a short presentation using existing footage of Pam and Robin. We took some film clips from Happy Days and some film clips from Sister Terry, and of course they bought it. The interesting part of the story is nobody told Pam Dobb. And my agent calls and he goes, you're not gonna believe it, I'm gonna read you out of variety. ABC has just announced their time schedule. Monday, eight o'clock, Gary Marshall announces Mork and Mindy, starring Robin Williams and Pam Dauber. Alien lives with girlfriend. You know, and that's, uh, and I went, what? Producer Gary Marshall flew to New York to have lunch with Pam and answer her questions about Mork and Mindy. She said, who are you? I never auditioned for you. It was all because in the commissary you looked cute, you were eating, the food wasn't dribbling down your face. What the heck? Gary hands me this tape, and he goes, this Robin Williams, I'm telling you, there's nobody like him. And I sat there and watched that Happy Days tape, laughing out loud. And so it was like, where do I sign up? Pam moved to Los Angeles to begin her Hollywood career. One of her first duties was a publicity photo shoot where she met her new co-star, Robin Williams. He's speaking to me in this broken Russian accent. I went back to the makeup room and I sat down and I said, I said to the girl, I said, is he, is he Russian? She said, he's not Russian, he's nuts. That summer, Pam began shooting the first episode of Mork and Mindy, but the process wasn't exactly what she thought it would be, thanks to Robin Williams' unorthodox approach to acting. If he didn't like a joke, then he would just go off. So there'd be areas where I knew, I don't know what he's gonna say here. I would go off and then she would have the, you know, the end, and thank you, you know, the kind of <gasps> bracketed. Mad Boy is done. She allowed him to go his way and, and bring out the best in him. Mork and Mindy premiered with an hour-long episode on September 14, 1978. Audiences went wild for the kooky alien and his good-natured friend. Mind if I do? <laughs> the pause that refreshes. You drink that with your finger. Yes, how do you drink? With my mouth? Well, how do you talk and drink at the same time? Must be Drool City. <laughs> now, look, whoever you are. Now, you can't scare me. Now, there's no such thing as a man from outer space. I don't know how you did those tricks, but if you just better keep your distance, or you're going to hear me scream like you've never heard anybody scream. I've never heard anyone scream. <laughs> is that your way of saying thanks? <laughs> uh-huh. Help has already arrived, so you just stay cool, space man, or else... <laughs> She loved playing with him, and he loved playing with her. That kind of chemistry is what uh, a writer or a director and producer dream about. No one was prepared for the success of Mork and Mindy. The show quickly moved to number one in the ratings. I think it just hit people by surprise. It was because it was so freeform. It had this kind of madness to it. Pam was the perfect victim for Robin's practical jokes on the set. She's got this great laugh that that would be the reward. You know, that she... Oh! Right. There was one time when Robin had to make a quick change in the door that was the bedroom. I'd just come out of the shower and I had a bathing cap on and this towel. Going upstairs, I'll be right back, Mindy. And I'm going upstairs and as I go upstairs, I drop the towel. He's stark raving naked. He's off camera, but he's naked. She's trying to act. The man is jumping around naked. Like she's just like, 
Oh, whoa! <laughs> it was just, and it was a warm night too, which helped. <laughs> At the end of Mork and Mindy's first season, both Pam and Robin received People's Choice Awards as America's favorite actors in a new TV show. She appealed to both women and men. The women were not intimidated by her, and the men thought she was just lovely and wonderful. Pam took her success in stride and never let it go to her head. She would still drive around in her Volkswagen with the top down. I mean, nothing ever changed. During her first hiatus, Pam went back to her first love, musical theater playing Eliza Doolittle in My Fair Lady with Ohio's Kenley Players. All I know is my best friend up there. It was great. It was, it was really special. When Pam returned for the second season of Mork and Mindy, the network had added two new cast members, Gina Hecht and Jay Thomas, as deli owners Jeannie and Remo Da Vinci. Pam and Gina became instant friends. I remember thinking she always seems so happy, even if she's, you know, not feeling that great. She presents herself with this air of positiveness. But the network wasn't satisfied with just making cast changes. They also moved the successful show from Thursday to Sunday night, opposite the popular CBS series, Archie Bunker's Place. We own Thursday nights. What else do they want? Now they gotta go play with Sunday night and they ruin the whole show. We went from the number one most watched show in, in years to in the 30s and never ever really recovered. Desperate to save the show, the producers experimented with more and more outrageous characters, like Mork and Mindy's son, Mirth, played by Jonathan Winters. Everyone was coming just to see Jonathan because he hadn't been on TV in so long. And that's when it got wild. I mean, it was almost like a two drink minimum some nights. So she was working with a couple of, couple of crazies the poor girl was with. I always realized what my position was. Somebody had to be sane on that show. It's like any good comedy team. The straight woman or the straight man has to really know comedy. I mean, really has to understand it and has to have timing. And Pam was just brilliant at it. Pam began to wonder if she would ever escape the sweet, wholesome, and perky image she had perfected as Mindy. Remember that word she hated, that word? She's perky. Perky Pam Dover. Perky Pam. <laughs> But in 1982, Pam got to show the world a whole new side of herself. She co-starred with Andy Gibb in the Los Angeles production of the Broadway musical, The Pirates of Penzance. When she opened her mouth, the audience levitated because they could not believe that that voice could come out of her. And she was a big smash, she got great reviews. Pam's earliest dreams were realized when she reprised her role in the Broadway production. As excited as she was about her television stardom, nothing compared to the thrill of finally standing on a Broadway stage. One of the things that she said when she first moved to New York is that she wanted to see her name in lights on Broadway. So the roommates, we all went to see Pam in the Pirates of Penzance and we saw her name, Pam Dauber, in lights on Broadway. So she made it. I think there's been no reward greater in my life for having accomplished something than having won that role. I wanted that so badly. Next on Intimate Portrait, Pam gets a chance to shine on her own show. It was probably seeing her without Robin, and they could really see what, what she did. And later, she takes on her most important role. She was besotted, the look on her face of contentment with that baby. When Lifetime's Intimate Portrait continues. Welcome back to Lifetime's Intimate Portrait of Pam Dauber. Pam Dauber had survived a bout with depression and the tragedy of her sister's death. After years of idolizing the performers she saw on the stage, she had decided to become an actress herself. With her first television role, she had become the star of America's number one hit show. And at the age of 30, she was starring on Broadway, fulfilling a lifelong dream. But in 1982, things were looking bleak on the television front. Mork and Mindy was canceled at the end of its fourth season, and the stars were kept in the dark, just as they had been when the show began. I read about it in Variety. I went off for like 25 minutes just ripping up the network because they don't have the cojones, which is an old Indian word, to tell you in person. You just read that it's over. It's a bit like you're still alive, <laughs> and they take you off life support. I couldn't believe that Paramount would not pick us up and pay for it themselves for that fifth year because fifth year syndication was when you made your big bucks. Pam was disappointed and angered by the cancellation, but she had a lot of other projects on the horizon. She traveled to Israel to make Remembrance of Love, 
a TV film about Holocaust survivors and their families. It was a marvelous movie. She played Kirk Douglas' daughter, and there were some heavy scenes in that that she was really able to let loose. Together with her manager, Mimi Weber, Pam formed a production company, Pony Productions. I formed Pony Productions as almost any actor or actress who is successful does. And I wanted to produce some television movies for myself. While she and Mimi looked for a new series idea, Pam made TV movies for CBS, traveling to Wyoming for Wild Horses with Kenny Rogers and to Japan for American Geisha. Meanwhile, her friend Gina Hecht had found the man she thought was Pam's ideal mate, Mark Harmon, the former UCLA football hero turned actor. Best known as the suave Dr. Bobby Caldwell on the series Saint Elsewhere, Harmon was also co-starring in a play with Gina. And she said, uh, well, I know someone I would like to introduce you to. And I said, really? And let me ask you, is it an actress? And she said, yeah. And I said, shoot me right in the head. Not a chance. <laughs> Gina refused to give up. She went to Pam next. But Pam had just had a bad breakup and had sworn off dating for a while. She said, no, no. No, no, no. I am not interested in meeting anyone. I don't want to date. I don't want a lunch. I don't want coffee. Don't call me. I said, OK. She said, well, OK, who is it? I said, is it an actor? I said, shoot me if I date another actor. Gina said, Pam, I'm telling you. And I said, all right, who is it? And she said, Mark Harmon. And I went, oh. <laughs> Finally, Mark broke the ice with a phone call. And within 20 minutes of talking to this guy, I ended up asking him out for that night. She said, you can watch the show. I said, what show? And um, it was Oscar night, but I hadn't seen any of the movies. <laughs> that was it for me. <laughs> An actor that didn't know the Academy Awards was on. Mark and Pam got together that night for a quiet dinner party with friends. I got the feeling from him that he just knew me from ages ago. And he came and he kissed me on the cheek. And everything about anything that was ever wrong with any relationship I'd ever had in my life was healed by this man. And I'll tell you, we were together every day after that. I was just comfortable, you know? I mean, just comfortable. She's kind of a regular person, easy to talk to and, and very friendly, which, uh, you know, is not a common trait in actresses. At the age of 34, Pam Dauber had found a man who was everything she had always wanted. After all those big studly men, she finally found a big studly man that was the right man. As my friend Molly said, after getting to know Mark, Mark Harmon is the kind of guy you pray to God you'll meet. But you leave out a few things because you don't want God to think you're too greedy. <laughs> but Pam's career wasn't going quite as smoothly as her romantic life. She was still unable to find a TV show to produce even though she and Mimi had heard over 150 pitches for series ideas. She got to a point where she was so confused that she mixed up all the shows. Finally, she said, you take the pitches. And if you think they're good, then you come to me. Finally, Mimi heard a pitch that she knew Pam would like. My Sister Sam, the story of a photographer whose 16-year-old sister comes to live with her. And I liked it, first of all, because I mean, it was just a good idea, because you could see, you have to see what the potential is for storylines. Pam put together a strong ensemble cast that included Joel Brooks, David Naughton, and Jenny O'Hara. But finding the right girl to play her younger sister, Patty, was much more difficult. The problem I have working with child actors is that they're so used to it that there's nothing natural about them anymore. They're not real. And we wanted a girl that felt real, and then we found Rebecca. Rebecca Schaefer was a fresh-faced, intelligent 18-year-old model who was just beginning her acting career. We flew her in from New York to audition her. And the minute I looked at her, I said, that's the girl. She was remarkable. Um, she's the kind of kid that you would say, oh, if I have a daughter, that's the girl I want her to be. Pam hired Rebecca on the spot, and the young actress stayed with her while they shot the pilot a few days later. I didn't have a sister anymore. And so she, I had made her my little sister in a way. My Sister Sam premiered on September 30th, 1986. Suddenly into my life popped this fat little baby that everybody thought was the cutest thing they'd ever seen. Suddenly, nobody wanted to watch me do cannonballs into the pool anymore. All they wanted to do was burp you. <laughs> I can't believe it. You were actually jealous of me. How'd you handle it? Oh, I used to ask Mom to let me take care of you, and then I'd dress you ugly. <laughs>
It was probably seeing her without Robin, and they could really see what, what she did. So she was kind of a newcomer, even though she was a veteran. Pam and Rebecca had already formed a special bond that came across on screen. Their comedy together, their connection, was uh, very real and very easy. You bought them immediately. Pam's first venture as a producer was a hit, and her victory was made even sweeter when she won her second People's Choice Award. To win it again for my sister Sam meant a lot to me because it was me without Mark. Next on Intimate Portrait, Pam is stunned by an unexpected tragedy. I don't think any of us uh, that were involved with Rebecca will ever get over that. And later, she shares the screen with one of the sexiest men alive. Pretty interesting experience. <laughs> when Lifetime's Intimate Portrait continues. This is Lifetime's Intimate Portrait of Pam Dauber. It had been nine years since Pam Dauber had soared to the top of the television world in Mork and Mindy. She was now starring in her second hit series, which she was producing herself, and her relationship with Mark Harmon was moving ahead at full speed. Less than a year after they had started dating, Mark and Pam decided to get married. I don't have a specific memory of Mark saying, will you marry me? It wasn't this bells and whistles big thing, it just was meant to be. They were married in April of 1987, but the wedding was kept secret from everyone except a few close friends. The thing that concerned Mark is that would that wedding turn out to be one of those paparazzi weddings? It was elegant, it was intimate, and it was such a happy occasion because I just felt in my soul that he was the right guy. He was her soulmate. We had just immediate family and close friends. And then we had a big barbecue the next day. It was just a party where we announced to all of our friends that we had gotten married. A few months later, Pam was delighted to discover that she was already pregnant. The expectant mother returned to the stage that summer in She Loves Me with her My Sister Sam co-star, Jenny O'Hara. But Pam and Mark were soon embroiled in a private family conflict that became tragically public. The couple had discovered that Mark's sister, Chris, had a serious drug addiction, and they found themselves in a vicious courtroom battle over the custody of her son, Sam. This was just a feeding frenzy for the press. In the meantime, I was doing my sister, Sam, fighting to have a 11-year-old child live with me and my husband at our house. Um, I was seven weeks pregnant. And I was doing theater. She was willing to be there for this boy, but it was tough and so public. Finally, a settlement was reached that returned Sam to his mother, but gave Pam and Mark visiting rights. They deemed that in order for Chris to be able to recover from her drug rehab, she needed her son back with her. Sam got through it. The good part of the story is that Sam's great. With the media frenzy dying down, Pam continued to work on My Sister Sam, but it was a challenge to find ways to hide her pregnancy on camera. During most of that season, she was behind furniture. You'd just see her head, and as her bust got bigger, of course, with the pregnancy in her stomach, you'd see less and less of her. <laughs> she would be from the collarbone up. It was very funny. Despite Pam's physical limitations, the cast and crew of My Sister Sam hit their stride in the second season, but once again, Pam was the victim of network tinkering that would ultimately sink the show. The president of CBS wanted our time slot. And so that was it. We finished all the shows, but they never got aired. When we were canceled, we were canceled being the number 16 show of the year, tying with LA Law. With my sister Sam off the air, Pam turned all her attention to her family. In April of 1988, she gave birth to a boy, Sean. Pam was overjoyed to be a mother for the first time at age 36. You know, it, it was like none of the things you think it's going to be. It's as an important piece of life as anything I've ever been part of. He was so wonderful. And she was in love. She was besotted. The look on her face of contentment with that baby. Soon after Sean was born, Pam went to work on a role that spoke to her emotions as a new mother. Do You Know the Muffin Man, co-starring John Shea, was a TV movie inspired by the McMartin case. Pam played a woman who discovers her child has been molested, but director Gil Cates needed some convincing before he would give her the role. Our casting director said, Pam Dorber, and everyone's first reaction, wow, Pam Dorber, wow. Does she do serious work? And we arranged to meet. 
When I went in on the meeting, I told them about a dream that I had had about my child being kidnapped. And I mean, I this was a terrible dream, and I got the role from telling them. And uh, I thought, my God, if there's any woman who could express the pain that would go with the question of uh, child molestation, surely she would be it, and she was wonderful on it. In the summer of 1989, Pam decided to take some time out from work. She and her family were vacationing when she received devastating news. 21-year-old Rebecca Schaefer had been murdered by a deranged fan who showed up at the front door of her apartment building. Mimi called me and told me that Rebecca had been murdered. And it was like, murdered? And I wanted it at the time to make sense to me. But when it was a fan, when it was someone that didn't know her. The uh, intercom was broken. So Rebecca went to the door herself. But this guy was, uh, he would have done what he did somewhere else. He was just hell-bent on finding her. She didn't know that he existed. It was someone that just did it because they were crazy, because they had delusions about this little girl that nobody knew. It was just too much. It was too much to believe. And because, I mean, she was my friend. The senseless murder moved Pam to political activism. She became involved in stalker legislation, and she uh, worked for the handgun control organization, too, because she was very affected by that. This tragedy has been responsible for changes in the law and for people taking a lot better care of themselves in terms of security, but it's like poison. It's forever poisoned the landscape. I don't think any of us uh, that were involved with Rebecca will ever get over that. Pam managed to move on with her life after the tragedy, focusing on her family. At the age of 39, she was determined to have another child, but this time, it wouldn't be as easy. I had um, three miscarriages in a row, and it, I mean, that's a, a sad, horrible time, and we ended up going through this experimental therapy, but I didn't trust it. Being pregnant was like, oh, I'm pregnant. In 1992, Pam went to Canada to film her first feature film in 14 years, Stay Tuned, co-starring John Ritter. But just as production started, she found out she was pregnant again. A few weeks later, she was told she would be able to carry her baby to full term. It was really one of the happiest days of my life, seeing that screen light up, and there is this little baby with this, this little, you know, see-through baby with this little beating heart. Oh my gosh, it's gonna happen. Coming up, the Harmons juggle career and family. I just don't think time with kids comes by again. When Lifetime's Intimate Portrait continues. You're watching Lifetime's Intimate Portrait of Pam Dauber. In her 30s, Pam Dauber had seen both triumph and tragedy. She had become one of America's best-loved TV actresses with Mork and Mindy and gone on to produce and star in her second successful TV show. She had found her perfect mate and started a family. She had also survived the loss of her dear friend, Rebecca Schaefer, and stayed strong through three miscarriages of her own. And at the age of 40, she was finally about to be a mother for the second time. Ty Harmon was born in 1992. Ecstatic to be a mom with two boys, Pam cut back on her career, but still got out once in a while for projects that interested her, like The Man with Three Wives, co-starring Beau Bridges. It's always a thrill when you get to work with somebody that you've admired or you've you know, grown up watching them in movies. Pam played a wife and mother who is unaware that her husband has two other families. What she brought to the project was not only her talent as an actress, which is really vast, but she also brought her sensitivity as a mother and, and uh, you know, being at the center of her family. Mark also adjusted his work schedule to be able to spend more time with the kids. Yeah, I just don't think time with kids comes by again. If that means we're selling the house and doing other things to make that work, then that's what you do. Throughout the 1990s, Pam made motherhood her first priority while keeping her hand in show business with an occasional TV movie. At the same time, she was actively working for her favorite cause, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America. I know that she spends an unbelievable amount of time in Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And uh, I, she's, you know, plans these, these gala events. Pam's got a big heart, and having parental guidance is, is a big thing to her. 
1997, Pam ventured back into full-time acting, starring in a new TV series called Life and Stuff, but she was relieved when it was canceled after only three episodes. I had my tap shoes on for everybody, and I had a very disgruntled husband, too, who, as much as he said, oh, go do what you want, if you want to go back, suddenly the program changed, and mom's coming home at 8.30 at night. <sighs> It just, it wasn't a good thing. In 1998, Pam had a chance to work with Mark for the first time ever in A.R. Gurney's play, Love Letters. She was really good in Love Letters. We had a very successful run with it, and it was a terrific experience. The couple worked together again the following year in the World War II film, I'll Remember April. Oh, well, hello to you, too. <laughs> I can't even catch her breath. <laughs> you don't mind a little machine oil. Uh -huh. I'm down on the floor off doing work on engine. Uh, you never going back to that office again. Well, we'll take a little machine oil for a kiss like that. Gotta, gotta <laughs> keep him flying, bud. Yep. Gotta keep him flying. It was the first time, uh, film-wise, we, we'd worked with each other. Uh, we'd been on stage together, but that's that's different. Um, pretty interesting experience. It's real interesting <laughs> when you're working with your mate. Um, I don't know that it's something that I would want to do all the time. <laughs> It was a lovely little movie, but quite honestly, I like hearing about his day, and I like telling him about mine. Both Pam and Mark continue to juggle family and career, being careful always to put family first. And for the present, Pam's enjoying full-time motherhood. Aside from being a mom, she's a buddy to these kids. She's a friend, you know? They talk to her. She talks to them. Every time I call her, she's on in the carpool, <laughs> doing homework. <laughs> yeah, um, she's a great mom. She's doing more homework now than she did when she went to school. I believe you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. And I have, I had a glorious career. I'm happy to have put my career way far on the left burner. The burner, the, 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 you know, the pilot light's still on but I'm not pursuing it. Pam continues to fight for causes she believes in. She's promoting a reading comprehension program for children and adults. She's also developing a musical theater workshop for the public schools. She takes things to heart, and she's one of those people that you'd rather have in your foxhole than not have. I find every day to be the excellent adventure. It's really about friends and family. It doesn't matter how many Emmys or Oscars you've won. Pam Dauber's life has been a wild ride with tremendous highs and devastating lows. But through it all, she's remained the same down-to-earth Midwestern girl with a future full of choices and possibilities. You know something? I think Pam's future is sensational. It, uh, she can do anything. I mean, she could play Lady Macbeth as far as I'm concerned. She's an amazing actress. She's being your mother right now. She's loving that, and she does a lot of great things. And whenever she wants, she'll come back and do it again. And obviously, it looks the same. Wow. She's paid her dues. I mean, she, she's worked hard. And at the same time, if she is enjoying life right now, it's because she's earned it. I am so grateful for my life. And, and I've had really hard times, but then so have most people. But I'm grateful for being able to have come out the other side of it and to have found a you know, wonderful partner and have these great little kids that I battle with regularly. It's fun. There's no reason why life shouldn't be fun. As any dedicated parent knows, you're always looking for ways to help your kids. Well, Pam Domber thinks she's found one. She's lent her name to an educational system that helps children with reading comprehension. I say let's take a lesson from Pam and do something extraordinary for our own kids. For Lifetime's Intimate Portrait, I'm Meredith Vieira.